Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, another great public program and in the series of our Sports and Public Service uh, Forum as we try to uncover the, the great guys and women that are out there in sports and public service. Um, our guest today obviously has very impressive stats uh, on the football field. Uh, to name a few, he's won a national championship with the Seminoles in 93-94. He was drafted... <laughs> Uh, Arkansas, yeah. <laughs> I know we're in Razorback country. I know we're in Razorback country. We, 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 we might get into Petrino later, but probably not. Um, <laughs> and uh, he was drafted 12th overall by the Tampa Bay Bucks in 1997. Selected to three Pro Bowls. Has been in the NFL over 10 years. Over 10,000 yards. One of 23 players. 23, right. I think Tiki was one of 23 also. Um, very, impressive, very impressive running back for the, for the NFL, uh, both with the Bucks and the Atlanta Falcons. But I would argue that the stats off the field are, are much more important to him. Um, one stat being that he has provided 84 homes for single parent households uh, in Tampa, Tallahassee, Baton Rouge, and Atlanta. Right. And with the goal of providing 10 a year, correct? Well, 10 to 12. If we can raise more money, hopefully do more. But right now, on average, we're like uh, 10 to 12 homes a year. 10 to 12 homes a year. So very impressive on and off the field. And so today, as we did with Tiki Barber, we're here to uh, learn a little bit about uh, Warwick Dunn, a little bit more that maybe you all don't know. Uh, and one other stat that they don't know, possibly, is that he was also an All-American sprinter as part of the 4 by 100 meter relay at FSU, correct? Correct. Okay. I, you did, I did your uncover research. that. You did your I, research. I did a little bit of research. Yeah. So, like we did with Tiki, we'll start from the top. Warwick, where were you born? I was actually born in New Orleans, Louisiana, at Charity Hospital. And my mom, she was only in New Orleans for a few months because my grandfather is, uh, lives in New Orleans. So we pretty much went back to Baton Rouge and I was raised in Baton Rouge. So raised in Baton Rouge. And what were your parents doing at that time? Well, my father wasn't around, but my mom, when she had me, she was still in high school. And I think a few years later, that's when she became a Baton Rouge City police officer. So from that time, really, so many different people came into my life at an early age that my grandmother babysitting me. I had people that I don't know today that said they babysitting me when, when I was younger. So that's kind of weird, right? Everyone is, everyone is engaged in my life. But it's, uh, my mom was, was the type of woman that she worked for everything. I mean, she sacrificed for everything. And that early in my life, she did that. She made sure that she could stay on track with her goals that she had. And if it was making sure she graduated from college, I mean, graduating from high school, but then she also ran track in college. So she had me still went to college, started college and, and ran track in college and she didn't finish college. So it was, uh, for her, it was making sure that we had everything we needed. And that's why she became a Baton Rouge City police officer. Now we went this early with uh, Tiki, so we'll, we'll go this early with you, but he describes an interesting relationship with his father. What's a, what was the relationship like with your father? Well, my dad was, uh, my dad, when you think back on it, I didn't meet my father until I was like 14 years old. And I just happened to be in Dallas, Texas. I ran summer track. I ran for a KY track club in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So I was just at a track meet. And what's weird is that I was up there talking to my mom. And then she walks over, and there's a man standing there, and she's just talking to him. And she comes over, and it's like, this is your father. So I'm just, I'm in shock. I'm just like, I'm just, I was in awe a little bit. And what's weird is that I also met a stepbrother at the same time who, who was, you know what it's like, 11 years older than me. So I had opportunity to, to finally be my father. And, and we exchanged information, and, and that was pretty much it. So I, he was in and out of my life for, for a short period of time, and I didn't really... I really didn't see him and talk to him that much until my mom passed away. That's when I felt like I owed him the respect of calling him saying, hey, my mom, she, just, she was just shot and killed. So he came, 
he came in town for uh, probably about two weeks, and he stayed at the house, and he was there for the funeral and everything else. And we had a strange relationship throughout college. I mean, I would say college, he came to some games and didn't come to games. I mean, he was coaching, he was a, a track and field coach at, at different schools, high school track in Dallas, but he also coached at a little uh, division two or three school in Kentucky, track and field. So when he had an opportunity to come and see me play in college, he did that. And definitely my senior year, he did that. So the last time I've seen him and talked to him was uh, my last college game. That long ago? That long ago. We lost him, unfortunately, Florida and the Sugar Bowl. That was my last college game. And that's the last time I've seen and talked to him. And do you have any siblings? Do I have? I have. I'm the oldest of six. So um, I have. Four boys, there's four boys, two girls. And there's two boys, a girl, two boys, a girl. Which is kind of weird, but we all get along, we all love each other, and we don't like each other at the same time, so. <laughs> it's a nice, it, any family, have, you have the ups and downs. So my family's unique. I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of laid back, reserved. I mean, I like to have fun. My brother, he's more of a business guy. The, the next one, the next oldest one under me, he's more of a uh, take charge guy, business guy. My sister, she's more like mom. I mean, it, it, in the whole family, she wants to do everything that my mom would have done. And the next boy is, I mean, to me, I just think he's, you know, he's searching for what he wants to do with his life. And, and Travis, who's the last boy, and he's married with three kids, just really grew up and matured and just really become a, a, a good brother, good father to his family. And the baby girl, all babies are babies. I mean, that's what she is. She's a baby. I mean, but she's maturing. She's about to get married. My sister's getting married on Mother's Day weekend. So I was happy about that because I don't have to worry about the, that, that check anymore coming out of my pocket. It's going to be, you know, her fiance's problem and situation. And to get into the book a little now as we, as we move on, who is Choo Choo? Choo Choo was a guy I met when I was 9, 10 years old. I was running track at LSU at the time, summer track club. And he was walking around talking to kids. And I mean, most coaches, when they're trying to find the next athlete, they go around and talk to, talk to different people. So it's like, that, guy, that kid right there, he can run really fast. And, and he also heard that I can play football. So he, he asked me, did I want to play football? I was like, I love football. I've been playing you know, since I was seven at that time. And so it's OK. I, I want you to come out. You're going to play on my football team. It's the South Baton Rouge Rams, uh, probably the best Little League team in Baton Rouge at the time. And what was weird is that he, didn't, he coached 11 and 12s. So I'm only 9, 10 years old, so I had to play with a group underneath him. They didn't want to give me a uniform because I was too small. It's like, this kid, he can't play football. He's too small. These kids are hurt him. It's like, give him a uniform. They gave me a uniform. The next thing, I was just rambling kids. I was just knocking kids out, running around kids, just, just making everyone else look crazy. So it was like, we have us a winner. And then I didn't lose a football game my little league years, from 9, 10 years old, 11 to 12. I mean. Middle school, I didn't lose my first game until I got to high school. So, I mean, Choo Choo was, he's, he's like everything to me. He's my, my, he's my father, really. I Still mean, a presence. Yeah, a presence. I mean, he doesn't like to fly, which kind of sucks, but <laughs> he, uh, he's a guy who, if I need him, he's always there. I mean, he, like I said, he's like my father. I mean, that's who I call for advice. That's who tries to help me dress. I mean, just teach, he's really trying to teach me the things that I, that I didn't get on a day-to-day -day basis in my household. So in regards to chapter five, and we'll stay in the early years just a suspect, <laughs> but it's entitled the early years. How would you describe your childhood? Well, I was bad. I was bad. I was in the hospital a lot. I mean, I, I broke my elbow. I was playing in, you know, Louisiana, we have ditches. I don't know if Arkansas, you have ditches, right? So that's like a little hole in the water. It rains. And we used to, I used to swim in a ditch. That was my swimming pool. So, so I'm, I'm in a ditch. I cut my knee open, have to get stitches. I broke my wrist. I was always in the hospital because I was, also, I was always outside playing, running around, riding bikes, playing street football. I mean, 
basketball with the rim around the tree. I was, I mean, baseball with the bats. I mean, I did it all. So I was always outside. I was always active. So that was the, I think for me, the, one of the best things my mom liked that if she, she always knew where to find me in the streets playing. I mean, I was always playing, but growing up, as I got older, I had, I still, I started to take on more responsibility to my family. I mean, I, since you, since you're the oldest, I was kind of responsible for making sure that that everyone did what they're supposed to do. So I learned to delegate. And as parents, we like to delegate. You clean, you clean the dishes, you mop the floor, you, and I did a great job of delegating what to do. <laughs> right? So I became like a, a leader. So I delegated the responsibility to the kids. And that's really like my role. That's what I just really have grown into. I don't like to clean up. I don't like to do anything. I like to delegate. <laughs> what to do to other people. So it was, uh, it was, it was a unique childhood because it's six of us in the household, six different personalities. Like I said, we, we got along, but then we also, we, you know, we would fight each other. We fought all, you know, all the time. It was just the personalities just clashing. But for me, that made us closer. We, we started to understand life a lot better, and we, we got along. But growing up, when you're not having a lot of money, not having a lot of clothes, we, we did the old school way. You just hand me down. You open the cabinets and you, whatever you had in there, canned goods, whatever, we made food that I don't even think was, you know, really safe to eat, right? So, we, <laughs> I mean, everyone made a casserole and everything else, but we, we did it, we did it all, right? We did it all. So, I mean, I, I learned how to cook to survive at an early age. I mean, it was, it was fun, but what's weird is that I had a guy who lived across the street from me, and we played outside in the street, because back in the day, kids used to play in the street all the time. So we played in the, in, in the street, played football. This, this guy, I call him Fred Flintstone. He was outside with no shoes on, barefooted, in the street, cutting, diving. I mean, it's like, are you even real? I thought he was a fake human, because he was never injured. His feet was the toughest thing around. So it was, it was, it was a great childhood, because I had a lot of great friends that we, we enjoyed beating each other up, hitting each other. And enjoy playing sports with each other. I think for me, that's really where I got my competitive nature from. I mean, I was always the smallest kid, but I, I enjoy beating people bigger than me. I mean, that was it's kind of unique. You continued to do that. I've been lucky. Well, I've been blessed. I've been blessed, right? right. So I, I've, uh, I have a knack for making big guys look silly. <laughs> And you did that in high school too, I, I suppose. And um, you talk a little bit about in the book about the high school that you went to, and it was a predominantly white high school. Talk a little bit about that. Well, the school is talking about is Catholic high school, and all boys, predominantly white. I mean, you have to pay to go to the school. So my mom, she only made thirty-six thousand dollars. So in reality, could she pay for me to go to the school? No. She literally went to the principal's office like. How much can you pay, Betty? I mean, she would just pull out a lot of money, just, this is all I have. And it's like, okay, well, that'll do. And it was one of those high schools where, I mean, at first, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't fit in. I, I mean, that just wasn't the case, because all my friends were in public schools. And when I, when I went to the school my freshman, went to this particular school my freshman year, it was probably like seven, seven to 10, 12, black kids in the freshman class. A lot of us went there just to play football, which you know, the coach that got me to go there, he was recruiting. And that's the first sign that I heard of recruiting kids to go to school. So I went there in the first nine weeks. The first, well, let me just keep it real. The first week of school was hell. I mean, it was hell because they challenged me from day one that the summer reading was important. We we're going to have tests on the first two days. And I was like, we don't do this in public school, right? So to me, that was an eye-opener. And it was in a school that really took adjustments. It challenged me to be better. It challenged me to want to wanna go to the next level and really advance in my life and, and, and not, just work, not just worrying myself about football, but what are you going to do if something happens in a game? So I, I really got the opportunity early on in, when I went to the school to not just think about sports, but think about academics. Worry about life outside of this, because what if something happens? And that's where I really started learning that. So my first nine weeks, 
this is kind of embarrassing. I hope kids really understand that. I had a 1.0 first nine weeks. It's like, how do you even do that, right? That's, that's <laughs> tough. That's tough. Right. I mean, but you have to think about it. If you go back and ask the principal at the time at the school, I was in the principal's office once a week. Remember, it's all boys. So I would go in the principal's office, literally. I was like, man, I don't know if I can do this right here. I mean, it got all these hard legs everywhere. I mean, I need some girls. I need to <laughs> And he was just like, well, work, that's just how it is here. You're going to have to just step up. And it, it, it was crazy that when my mom, really, when she realized that I couldn't play football anymore my freshman year, I couldn't play any sports, period, that she just really just challenged me. So I learned another lesson. I mean, just early on, I was going to be challenged, not just at home, but at, at this particular school. And Believe it or not, because I went to this all, all white school, these kids really embraced me. I mean, their families took us in, and we, we, we did it all. I mean, I ate free it because a lot of these kids were rich, and their parents owned the Waffle Houses, the, the, uh, the Mr. Gaddy's pizzas, and, and you know, all these different places, these steakhouses, and we used to go and eat for free. I mean, so I, I got used to the word free early, right? <laughs> so I, I really enjoyed the life, but they really just opened up their homes to, to myself and my other teammates, other uh, black kids. And I just really stopped looking at color and, and just really created a bond. So for me, early on in my life that I forgot, I didn't worry about race anymore because I just felt like we were all equal because they actually took the opportunity to, to open up their homes, to to really just take us in and to teach us, you know, these are things that you can have if you work for it. And, and I learned that early. And, and Catholic High was definitely, I would say, the, the stepping stone for me of just advancing my life, graduating, and, and, and just really seeing a different part of, the, of life that I wouldn't have experienced, unfortunately, in Baton Rouge at a, at a public school. On page 21, uh, he has specific pages, right? Uh, on, on pay, just for reference, for reference, if everybody has a book out there. But this is where it begins to change, um, because you talk about the day that your life drastically changed. Right. And I, I quote from the book, the telephone rang around 12.30 in the morning of January 7th. It startled me. What happened next? Well, I got a phone call at 12.30 from another police officer. Um, it's a family friend, so he called me at 12.30. I'm, Think about it. We had a bed, three bedroom house we were renting. It was four boys in one room and two girls in another room, and my mom had a room. In reality, me and my mom shared a room. So I, was, I always used to sleep with my mom. I was always in bed with her. I mean, she didn't have a man. Her, her man was her kids. So I was like her man. And, and I, I slept in the bed with her. So that particular night, I was waiting on her to get home. And I get a phone call at 1230, just saying, hey, your mom has been shot. And at first, I was like, you joking. It's like, no, yeah, no, she's been shot. Um, don't wake anyone up, I'm gonna come and get you. So I said, okay, at that particular moment right then and there, I knew she wasn't coming home. I mean, for some reason, I just knew it. So I get the phone call, I get dressed, I didn't wake anyone up, I sneak out the house. So he's out, I mean, he must have got to my house in minutes, and we just flew to the, to the uh, hospital. And I walk in, and the first person I talked to was the police chief. They take me to a room, and I'm talking to the police chief on the phone. It's like, I'm sorry. We're going to do everything we can to catch these guys. We're going we're gonna to find out who did it, and, and they're going to pay the price. I said, OK. I, I, I still don't know at that particular time if my mom is dead or alive. So when I hang up the phone, they have me in the room, and, then I said, follow me here. So I, I go into a room, and my mom was just laying on the bed in the hospital room, and it's just police officers surrounding the bed. Right then, I mean, I was speechless, you know, because the fear that I knew became a reality. And I saw that, and, and I was speechless, and, and I got emotional. And the first thing I wanted to do was, well, I need to go back home to my brothers and sisters. And before I can leave the hospital, my grandmother's there, my other brother's there, and just it's just pandemonium. So it's a life-changing event that 
I can, I'm sure when, when I'm asleep, I can talk in my sleep about it. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those emotions and imaginations that I would never, I would never ever experience. I don't care if I'm paralyzed or if I go brain dead, I just think that vision, the, that process, that, that, that timeline that I haven't had in my life at that particular time, I just think that's going to be there forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever, no matter whatever happens to me. Because to have those, you, you're one, you at one particular place emotionally, then you have an incident that takes you to another place. I'm a, I remember that. So drastically. Vividly. Yeah. I'd like to read a little bit. Um, the Officer Down Memorial Page, Inc. is an internet site that honors and pays tribute to law enforcement officers. This was a, this was a, a, a little note written by Major Gardner, who was a co-worker of, of your mother. Your death came at a time in our history when we were trying to find ways to work together in a community divided. You were the conduit through which all of us came to see each other as one. Your contribution to the department went way past the things you accomplished. Your legacy will be remembered by the love you had for all of us. Rest easy, your work was done here. As the oldest of six, this changed significantly. Yeah. How did your role change? Well, I became a father figure. I mean, the responsibility of my family just, it, really, it fell on my shoulders. I mean, and what was weird is that I didn't even have to hesitate on what I was going to do or if, what's the next direction for my family. The first thing I thought about, it, after I left the hospital, I'm, I'm driving back. And I, as soon as I get to the house, my pops walk, walks outside, choo-choo, it's like, you have to stay strong. So I remember that. And from this day, I, you know, I always have to be strong for my family. And I knew that I was going to do everything in my power to make sure that we stayed together. So, and that was one of the things that even, because family services, they came to the house when they hear that a, a single mother of six was shot and killed. They came to the house and, you know, the support system that we had just all came together. My grandmother was like, you know what, forget this. I'm gonna give up my life. I'm gonna come live with you guys and 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 make sure that we all stay together. And that was my my focus. I, I wanted to make sure everyone was going to continue to go after the goals that they wanted, the goals that my mom wanted for us as, as kids. And I was gonna do everything in my power to to make sure that we were all successful, that we were gonna live good lives, and that we was gonna all accomplish the dreams and goals that she wanted but also what they want, what, what my brothers and sisters wanted. So I just knew that I had to grow up and become a man at an early age, and I did that I, without hesitation. And it was it's one of those things I don't regret. My life has been, I've had a great life so far. I mean, unfortunately, I had to deal with a tragedy to, uh, to help me see some of the greater gifts that I can get from something that was so tragic. So. It's something that I, I, I don't regret one bit. And I know things happen for a reason. It took me a long time to get to that point in my life that things do happen for a reason. And we, we all are uh, remorseful and regretful. And we all want to, don't get me wrong, we, my mom was shot and killed. I wanted to revenge. I mean, that's the first sign that we have. You want to, you want to get revenge. You want to you know, find the people that did this and pay them back. But over time, I just felt like it was a bigger purpose. And I sacrificed everything I had for my family. And if it was me going to Florida State to play football, I was going to do that. Just thank God that we all came together as a family and they said, you know, we want you to go and live out your dreams. We will be OK. And I had enough support system around me that I felt comfortable in doing that. And I did it. And Life, it is, it is what it is. I mean, everyone, everyone's doing okay, but at the same time, I, I didn't have a, you know, I, I went to college, but I didn't go to college. I mean, I was, just imagine, you go to college, and most college kids, you want to go out, you want to, and we all went to college. We went to college, you parted, you, unfortunately, you did things we're not supposed to do, just parents don't want you to do. I mean, for me, I didn't do that. I mean, I didn't drink, smoke, 
party at all. I just went to class, went home, and I sat in my house. And, and if my, one of my best friends in college, he ran track with me, and he used to throw parties at his house all the time. I was the, I was the craziest one where I always went at six or seven when they was getting ready for the party. So when the party got ready to start, I, was, I would always leave and go home. I mean, that's what I did. And people used to say, he's weird. He don't, and I, I didn't talk to a lot of people. I was so, I was so much of, I was so much of an introvert. I was, I really didn't experience college the way that I think a lot of people felt like I should have. I mean, when you're a football star, I mean, you have everything there. You can go out, have a great time. For myself, I didn't do that. I, I thought about, okay, my mom's death, you know, my family, I gotta graduate. I mean, I didn't really, honestly, I didn't care about the NFL until after my junior year when everyone thought I was leaving to go to, to the league. I, I wasn't even thinking about the NFL. I was just thinking about, okay, my mom wanted me to graduate from college. I wanted to make sure I can get a, get a degree so I can get a job to help take care of my brothers and sisters. That, that was it. So my life was really dedicated to my family, but I was hard on the inside. I, was, I had no emotions. I mean, I, I dated girls, but it, you know, if you ask a girl that I dated seriously, and I put some of that in the book, I mean, it was, it was bad. I mean, I was bad, right? Because I didn't show any emotions. You know, women like the guy to be emotional. I mean, I, I, they wanted to go out. I didn't really want to do that. I mean, I, was, I wanted to sit at home. I was content with watching, and in college, Martin was the TV show that we always watched every week. So I watched Martin on the reruns. I mean, that was my thing. I stayed inside. I can tell you, like, who really, the guy who put the nail in the wall, I felt like I was inside the four walls of my house in college, that I could tell you who was working on that house, to name the people that was putting nails in the wall and laying, laying the wood up. I mean, that's... That's how much I stayed inside, and, and my life was family. So if something happened, I left Tallahassee and went back to Baton Rouge. Moments notice. Coach Bowden, I mean, he understood that, he accepted that, but I mean, my family, my life was my family, so that. Well, you transition now into your, into your relationship with Coach Bowden. How was that? What was that like? Because obviously, I mean, you were a USA Parade, All-American, honorable mention, coming into... So I didn't know that, right? Oh, really? I, well, I knew that, but I didn't it's know that the at the time. I didn't, what I'm saying, I didn't know that at oh. the time. I mean, I, I learned about that later, but my relationship with Coach Bowden was, um, was special. It was unique, I mean, because the guy... I had just lost my mom, then I went to Tallahassee like a week and a half later. So I was still fresh, and I didn't really enjoy the recruiting trip, because I was... I was walking around with Kez McCarvey, and, and he's trying to convince me, you need to come to Florida State. And I'm just like, Kez, I mean, it's, I mean, it's cool, man. I'm just, you know, I'm just really not into it. I mean, he's taking me, well, we could party over here. They have these parties. And I'm just like, Kez, I'm good, man. We can just go play the PlayStation, you know. We can just sit down, <laughs> at, you know, we can just go play. And, and Coach Bob and I had opportunity to, to sit down with him in his office, and he's just like, if you come here, I'm going to really uh, look after you, and, and my door is going to always be open for you. And when he said that to me, and I was the only head coach that, to say that to me during that time. So I just felt like, you know what, this guy is genuine, and I'm going to become a Florida State Seminole. So I felt comfortable. I mean, he's a special guy. I mean. The guy in college, when I was in college, we used to, I used to just go to his office. He had open door policy. I used to just go to Coach Bowden's office. And we'd sit down, we were just talking about life. We weren't talking about football or my academics. We were talking about my family. They're like, so Coach, what, you know, my sister's trying to date, right? So I had to, I had to ask him a question. I said, my sister's trying to date this guy. I mean, how did, how did you hand, handle it in, in your situation, son? Well, Warren, because he always called me Warren. He never called me Warren. Well, Warren? <laughs> we, you know, well, you know, I, I did all right here, right there now, talk about that. And, and it was just a really good conversation. I took those experiences that he shared with me, and I took them and really just formed them in my life and tried to use them to the best that I could. So. Now, I'm not going to get between you and Tiki, but obviously he <laughs> talked about this game that y'all played. I got in. Yeah. Um, 
but the day was very different for the both of you on different scales. How was it different? Because he, talks, he talked a little bit about how the day was much different for you. Besides the football game, how was that day different for you? Well, we, the game he's talking about, we played, I'm at Florida State Tiki's at Virginia. It was a Thursday night game. And we playing at Charlottesville. It was a big game. Virginia beat us that night. ESPN. ESPN, they cheated, right? So I, I got in. I got in. I scored the touchdown. But I mean, my focus, <laughs> my focus really wasn't even there. I mean, I played the game, and, and I thought I had a pretty good game. But I mean, as soon as that game was over, with, I was, I was trying to get back to Tallahassee, get on the next flight, and go to Baton Rouge because my mom's trial was going on. So I had to testify on that Friday. So my focus wasn't even, I didn't even care if we won or lost. I mean, I always want to win, but I was like, I need to get back because my family's watching the game, but they're also having to deal with the, the trial on a day-to-day -day basis, and I was just dealing with it you know, from afar. So when I, have, when I had the opportunity to go back, I mean, it just meant that much more to me that yeah, we lost the game, and people talk about that. Where were you yesterday? I, I was in Charlottesville, we lost the game, but who cares about that? I, I mean, this is what I'm here for. So I, I just felt like it was important that I fly back, get back to Baton Rouge to, to be there with my family during the sentencing phase of the trial. And that's the day when they, they came back and said they were all um, guilty and going to die by lethal injection or electric chair, whatever. And before we move on to that, I want to touch on, because you have a whole chapter dedicated to this, you obviously helped Charlie Ward win a national championship in 93, 94. Right. Talk, to, talk a little bit about his influence on you and being his roommate. You were his roommate that year, correct? My freshman year, which is kind of unique, right? How many fifth-year singers want to room with a freshman? I mean, that's not, that, that, that really don't happen Doesn't at happen. all. That, I mean, that's not even reality. But what was weird is that Coach Bowden thought that we would be a good match. But Doug Williams at the time, because he's from Zachary, Louisiana, and just outside of Baton Rouge, knew my mom pretty well and knew I was going to Florida State. So he knew Charlie and reached out to Charlie. It's like, Charlie, when work, get up there. You need to look out for him. He's a really good kid. He's just going through a lot. And the first time I ever talked to Charlie on the phone, I mean, we must have talked for 30, 40 minutes. And at that particular time, I wasn't saying a lot. Charlie wasn't a Santa. He, he, he didn't talk a lot. So a lot of people think the phone call, we were just holding the phone. But we actually, <laughs> like, we, we, we actually had a conversation. And it was easy to talk to him. So he was like, you know what? I, I want you to be my roommate. And, and I was happy about that. So when I was there, we, we had an opportunity to really just sit down and, and talk. And it was times when I was emotional. And I mean, I'm crying. This guy saw me. Most people say at the worst, you know, because I was vulnerable. I was crying. I was talking about emotions that really I hadn't shared with anybody. And, and I had opportunity to sit in my dorm room. And we both loved to sleep on the sofas. We, was both, we both loved to watch the same stuff on TV. And we, we had opportunity to bond. And he was someone that I, can, that I was able to share things with. And, and he did the best that he could and offered me advice when he, when he wanted wanted to say something. So it was, uh, it was a unique relationship that, you know, I don't even know if I would have been able to make it, even though Coach Bowden's door was always open. I don't even know if I would have been able to really function the right way without Charlie. I mean, it was, he got me through that first year, though. I mean, he was, he was a guy who was there for me, who understood me, didn't judge me. He knew that I was a little different because of what I went through, and he accepted that. So. So we'll fast forward to 1997, and you get picked 12th overall. How'd that feel? Man, I couldn't believe it, really. I was really mad, honestly. I was mad because I felt like I, felt like I should have been the first pick in a draft. Of course, of course. <laughs> I mean, but you have to think about it, right? When someone tells you if you're 5'11", 210, you're the first pick in the draft. OK, I'm not 5'11", I'm 5'9", I was 175 at that time, so it's just like, if I was a couple of feet higher and a little heavier, then I'd have been the first pick. So I was upset. I was, supposed to, I was projected to go top six. Then I dropped to eight. Then I dropped all the way to 12. So you know, I was kind of, I was upset. But I was thankful at the same time. I mean, it was, it was one of those days that 
I will always cherish because they wanted me to fly to New York and I didn't want to do it. I wanted to be with my family. So I went back to Baton Rouge and we sat in the house and it's the longest, like two and a half hours ever because it's 30, 15 minutes every pick. So it was a long time waiting and Coach Dungeon calls me. It's like, hey, do you want to be a Tampa Bay Buccaneer? Of course. I mean, who, who wouldn't? <laughs> so I just put the phone down and before they announced my name, I just ran into the back and just dove on the bed. And I couldn't believe it. So my family heard and everybody just went crazy and then I didn't have to watch the draft no more. It was just, yeah. <laughs> we just started barbecuing, you know, having a good time. And for all the football fans out there, and I didn't know this, but you ran a 4.27 at the Combine? Well, I, well, I didn't run Something at, like that? I mean, it's close. Well, I didn't run at the four, Combine. 4.28? Yeah, I ran 4.28. I didn't run at the Combine. I, I was just like, man, I'm about to get out of here. And literally, I was at the Combine for probably about a day and a half. I mean, I, I did the physicals. I didn't do a workout or nothing. I just say, you know what, forget it, I'm out of here. If they, if they don't know I can play football by now, they're going to never know, right? So I just left. And then once pro day came, I, I, had, I did pretty good on pro day. I ran 4 two, two eight that day. So I shut everybody up. That's pretty, that's, that's pretty fast. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Tony, Tony Dungy and, and his influence on you. Well, I, I met Coach Dungy on pro day. And he asked me, would you like to come and play in Tampa? Of course. I mean, I was like, yeah, coach, I would like that. So he just watched me work out. And he just really take, took notice of me. And I have to thank Derek Brooks, because Derek was like in his ear, we need to draft work done. We need to draft work done. He played at Florida State with me. So Yeah, he's had some vested interest there. Yeah, he, he did. Well, when I used to run over him when I was a freshman, that's probably why. I <laughs> Don't tell Derek that. but. I, uh, my rookie year, I got drafted, and we had rookie camps and, and training camp, and Coach Dungy set all the rookies down in a room, and he came in, it's like, listen, you know, you guys, we, we draft quality young men, talented young men, but if you're really going to live in this community, you want to be able to figure out what you want to do to give back. And to me, I took that as a challenge. I mean, everything I took as a challenge, so... I took it as a challenge and I, I tried to think about what I wanted to do to just to really make a difference in the community. And I just pondered and pondered and pondered, you know, different ideas. I mean, I know Stephanie and Stephanie Waller, the lady, she was my executive director at one time in the book, she was like, do you want to put ACs in people's homes in Florida, because it's hot in the summertime. It's like, no, nah, I don't want to do that. That's, to me, that's really not touching, touching someone's life the way that I want to. And I can really just think about my mom and, and her dream, her goal was to run her home. So Coach Dungey is definitely like that inspiration because he challenged me to not just be, to be common, but to be uncommon. And that spoke really to me in your book, to Tony Dungey, to actually say that to a team. Is, is pretty significant. I also believe, and I don't know how many of you know this, but um, Stephanie was, Stephanie her Wall. title was director of... Well, she was community relations right, with community the Bucks. Relations. So... But she didn't have to do this to where she tried to find your passion, and I thought that was really neat. Well, she really went, went out of her way. I mean, I owe Stephanie a lot, because when I was tossing out ideas, she was tossing out ideas, and really, it's, like she asked me important questions. I mean, what do you what do you know? I mean, really, I didn't know anyone who had cancer, or sick of cell, or anything like that. And I so said, was my mom? You know, she went to her own her own home. And obviously, what's come out of that now is the Work Done Foundation. The Work Done Foundation, the program that's called Homes for Holidays. But what's weird is that my I was in Tampa for five years, then I went to Atlanta. The first five years, it was just a program that Stephanie ran because she was part of the uh, community relations department with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers at the time. So I just pretty much wrote a check and we did the program and she actually did the program. My, my thoughts, my vision, she made it all happen. And when I signed with the Atlanta Falcons, that's when I started to work on foundation and I hired her away from the Tampa Bay, I mean, yeah, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So I was about to say, but yeah, Tampa Bay. <laughs> and, and we'll finish just one more, one more thing. Um, we had the opportunity, I was talking to you earlier, we had the opportunity in December, a couple of classmates and myself, to go down and interview Yao Ming and Tracy McGrady about sports and public service. And Yao Ming was interviewed in Chinese, 
And this is what Yao Ming had to answer. This was the question to Yao Ming. What do professional sports have to do with public service and what kind of role can athletes play? And you didn't know you had so much in common with Yao Ming. I think we can take the lead. Yeah. yeah. A couple well, things. Well, Maybe he's not. Seven, six, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm Give a or take. Guy. Yeah. I'm, he says, I think we can take the lead in public service because professional sports like basketball and football get a great deal of public exposure. Many athletes are celebrities. So since we enjoy the public support, we should also take some responsibility for the public's well being. Warwick Dunn, when Hurricane Katrina happened, sent a letter to every NFL player asking them to contribute $5,000 of their paycheck. You get me if I'm wrong. $5,000 of their paycheck to, for hurricane relief. I don't know of any other athlete that takes that time to do that. What, what did that mean to you? How did you come to do that? Well, first of all, was a, all the things that was happening in New Orleans, and being from Baton Rouge and born in New Orleans, and I was, always, I was pretty much, I pretty much lived in New Orleans too. I was always there. And I just felt so bad for what was going on. And I was like, somebody need to do something. I mean, Somebody needed to say something. And you know, I was trying to get ready. We was in preseason. I was trying to get ready for a game. And I just mentally, I wasn't even thinking about football. I was like, Jim Moore was the head coach of the Falcons then. I was just like, Coach, you know, Coach, I need you to set up so I can get on TV and, and you know, I, I need something to say. I, I have something to say that I want to share. And, and I told him the idea. And he was like, go for it. And I really just wanted to challenge all, just all the players in the NFL. It's like 1,500 guys, it's, you know, $5,000 a guy. And a lot of times I, I know these guys and I know how, how they blow money sometimes. So I just feel like if you're gonna blow some money, why not give it to a cause, give it to people who need it? I mean, these people are just struggling. So I just said, well, why not give $5,000 except for the Saints players, because they're in the middle of it also, except the Saints players, we all give $5,000 so we can help. I mean, and that's just scratching the surface in reality. I mean, this billion dollars of damage and, you know, money, money's gone, but why not just show that we do care? I mean, so many guys live, have played there, enjoyed Estes Festival and, and Mardi Gras and, and conferences. I mean, different things have gone on. Uh, we have to care about more than just ourselves. I and mean, we have to care about, our, our, this country has to come together pretty much. So I just, I challenge guys. Then guys, they were on board with it. A lot of guys, I mean, anytime you see a Tom Brady, it's like, you know what, I'm bored with what Warwick says. I mean, I felt like I, I, I did the right things. I mean, you had some high profile guys who agreed with what I said and, and felt like action needed to be taken. And just uh, as a catalyst alone, you raised over 381 million, uh, 381,000 just on the, on the Falcons alone. Falcon. And well, the whole this was a catalyst. Well, yeah, but the whole the organization, organization overall, over $2 million. Right. You know, overall. And 22 million in the NFL. Yeah, so, so the power, the you power know, of one. Sometimes you've got to punch the NFL front office, right? You have to punch them and hit them a little bit for them to come up off some money. So they, they did a little bit. Yeah. And I'll finish with this uh, Coach Tony Dungy. Why not finish with this? <laughs> Reading this, if you want to, I mean, I've, I have just scratched the surface on this book, and this is a great, great book. Uh, reading this was an eye-opening experience for me. The deeper I got into this book, the more I was able to look back at our years together and understand Warwick's challenges. As those moments became clearer to me, my appreciation for the real Warwick Dunn grew immeasurably. I was proud of him. Now proud seems too simple of a word. Warwick Dunn, to me, epitomizes what we should want in the National Football League players. He is a winner and a great role model for our young people. He's a leader and has been a beacon in the community both in Tampa and Atlanta. His desire to play in the NFL was not so he could make money and be a star, but so he could change the lives of other people. His dream was to translate the talent that God gave him on the football field into something truly meaningful for society. Ladies and gentlemen, Warg Dunn. Sweet, I can do that. I sit down. <laughs>
We have time for a couple of questions. Raise your hand and we will pass around the mics. So we'll start with you. <laughs> Thank you, Warwick. Uh, fascinating and very enjoyable story. I'm proud of you. What can I do as a parent of a son to, uh, you know, to uh, imitate what your mom may have done to turn, you know, raise such a wonderful son to try to guarantee this kind of success? Not on the football field or anything like right, that, right. but just a great person mm -hmm. overall. Well, you know, the relationship I have with my mom, I, we were like best friends. I mean, when I said something bad, she didn't tear me down. She talked to me like I was her friend. And I, I just think we had a special and unique relationship. And, and it's hard for me to say, well, if you're this way with your kids or that way, that they're going to turn out a certain way. It, I mean, what kids have to realize, too, is that it's a choice that we all make. I mean, it's a conscious choice. Because, don't get me wrong, I can, I can do some crazy things if I wanted to, but it's a conscious choice that I care about my family's name. I mean, to me, my mom sacrificed so much, and she did so much that I wanted to do things for her. I mean, because it meant enough to me that to make her happy that, that things that she's worked for that she could see it in me, and, and, and I wanted to do that for her. So, I mean, I would challenge the kids, because parents can be parents. You guys can provide, and, and you can try to have a relationship. You can support, but the kids have to take it upon themselves to really say, you know what? My, my mom, my dad, they're going far and beyond what they probably should do, that I need to do my part, and, and, and I do that. I mean, what's crazy in my family, and, and people don't realize, I'm like the father, the grandfather. I mean, I am everything to my family. And the, relationship that, the relationships that I have with those guys, I mean, that's what it is. I mean, I, my, my sisters, I'm like their father in a sense. I'm their brother, but they call me, anyone in my family, they call me for advice or to, to just be there like a parent would, and, and I'm like that. So I have a, a, a relationship that those guys can talk to me about anything, and if I need to chastise them, I chastise them, but you know, it's, it's, it's a special, unique relationship, and it's like that with everybody, and not just the girls, but the boys. I mean, believe it or not, they, everyone calls me first before they would call my grandmother or my pops or something like that, so I have to be uncommon. Uh, uh Warwick, uh, my question, I'm always a fan and much bigger fan after having a chance to meet you in one on one and having a conversation with you a few years ago in Atlanta. But I recently read an article and I don't, I don't know if it's in your book, but I wanted you to say something about it because a lot of people experience tragedy in their life. But recently you had a chance, I think, and you took the time to go back and meet the person that evidently was the trigger man. And I read that article, and I thought it was very interesting. Could you kind of say a little bit about that? Because you did do that. Yeah, well, y'all all need to go get my book. Right. <laughs> that is the first chapter in my book. And I think with the book, it really engages people that I had opportunity to, to go to Angola prison two years ago. And I sat down face to face with a guy who shot and killed my mom. And we sat in this little room. He was in chains and, and, and everything else orange suit, and we'd sit down at a table just like this. I mean, it wasn't a glass or anything. And we sat down, and I was able really to just get some things off my chest. Because for so long in my life, I mean, I was, like I said, I was hard on the inside. I mean, I didn't show any emotions. I, I didn't, people didn't know if I cared. I didn't smile. I, I wasn't laughing. I wasn't having fun. And I really needed to, to go and talk to this guy to really just let him know how this one incident has affected every aspect of my life. I mean, it, expect, it, it, it has affected me in, in dating other girls. I mean, it just I wasn't really comfortable in doing the little things that women need sometimes to feel secure with a guy. And that's holding the hand when you're walking down the street. I would not do that because so much of um, my emotions were still stuck with my mom. I mean. I mean, I used to walk high school football. No kidding, I can show you the film. My last high school football game, we lost. I'm on the field, 40 yard line, walking off the field, holding hands with my mom. I mean, it's like, how many high school kids do that? I mean, that, that really don't happen, right? So, I mean, I did that. And 
I expressed so much uh, frustration and, and just really just got some things off my chest that he needed to hear, but also I let him talk. It wasn't just one-sided. You know, we had a conversation. He said some things, and you know, he can tell that I was on a journey, uh, and, and I was searching for answers, and I, and I was trying to get to this point in my life where I had peace, because you know, when you have peace, you know, things are going well. You're laughing. You're smiling. You're really enjoying life, and, and I, I've been on that journey for so long that I needed to uh, let him know how much you know, this incident has affected my life, like I said, but that I forgive you. I actually told the guy who shot and killed my mom I forgive him. And I think he was shocked at that, but in reality I was because, I mean, it had, it had been, what, since I sat down and talked to him, 13 years, 13, 14 years since my mom's death. And I was at peace where I could sit down across from him at a table with, without any restraints, without a glass, and say, you know what? I forgive you. He said he didn't, he, he said he didn't do it. So, you know, if you didn't do it, I forgive whoever did it because I need to do this for myself and I took it upon myself. So the chapter really just talks about that. It talks about just, you know, just really going beyond anything anyone else probably has ever done in their life. I don't like them gators, okay? <laughs> but, but, right. But just really, that just, that just forced me to, um, to, to accept things the way they are by, by telling a guy, and it's really sitting down face to face with him, that I wanted to take control of my life back. I wanted to have that control back so that I can be free and live and enjoy life. Because believe it or not, I want the next phase of my life. I want to go to the next phase. I want to have kids. I want to get married. I want to, you know, we all had these visions when, when we were, kids of the white picket fence and you're married and everything is gravy, right? So, I mean, I should be able to have the same dreams and aspirations like anyone else. And, and I was on that quest for that. We had a question over there. Yes. How you doing, sir? How you doing? Uh, my name is uh, William Young, and I brought a group of my young men from my program from McClellan High School that are members of the track as well as the football team uh, from the Step Up Support Center. And just hearing your story, I've always, I'm an athlete as well, played basketball at Philander Smith College. And so I've always keep in contact and keep up with a lot of different athletes that have things that they have to go through and still reach their notoriety that they have presently. Could you please speak of, because a lot of my young men, as well as the young women that are in my program, have similar issues, not as drastic as your mother being killed, but a lot of issues that cause them to have problems as far as at home, community, in schools, and certain programs that they are involved in. But could you please speak on the value of understanding your self-worth so they understand that, yes, you can uh, have dreams and aspirations to achieve higher levels such as basketball, football, and lawyers, and other prominent professions, but understanding your value of self-worth and dignity to obtain. Could you please speak on that for me, please, sir? Well, I think it's, it's crazy that you say that because I mean, so much has happened this year already. I mean, it, I'm not a racist guy, you know, you know, but when you have your first black president, I mean, that should give kids of all color aspirations that you can do whatever you put your mind to. It's a, it's a, like I said, it's a choice that we make, and we can't, I just feel like we can't just settle to be what we see people do every day in life. I mean, we have to, you know, like what you say, what you do with these kids, you have to show them that, you know, it's, it's a better life outside of what you see every day. And, and when I say that, meaning, and let them know, they can take them to space, to Houston, to the space program, let them know, you know what, you guys can really study and, and, and learn about the stars, or, you know, if you want to teach them that they can be doctors. You want to take them to an emergency room where they, they're showing people having surgery. They can see the inside of someone's body. To me, that stuff is fascinating. If kids are not really wanting to be challenged, to be different, and sometimes you're just beating, you're beating your head against the wall. And, and I, I think kids today really need to take upon themselves to, to want to be more than just athletes. You know, I like lawyers, but everybody says, I want to be a doctor, a lawyer. You know, we need that, but those are the three common things you hear all the time. I mean, it's, 
You could be a veterinarian. There's nothing wrong with being a veterinarian. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with being a nurse. I mean, I mean, a lot of people are police officers. I mean, you have to have guys who have to understand how to, you know, to be an architect. I mean, you can show them so many different avenues. I mean, kids can go and travel and work with animals, you know, or at the aquarium. I mean, it's so much more the kids can experience today. And we have to do it as adults to open them up to see something that's different than what they see on their corner of the world every day. And they have to take it upon themselves because their family name should mean everything to them. I mean, we all walk around and, and if we see someone in our family name is in a newspaper or something like that, I mean, it brings shame in the sense of it's not good press. So kids have to take it upon themselves to, to want to be different because, I mean, I commend you what you're doing, but you only can do so much if they are not receptive to what you're doing. I mean, they have to want to receive that knowledge, that receive that information. And, and they have to want better for themselves because, believe it or not, we all know this, we can watch MTV, BET, whatever, we watch the videos, we can, we can grow up and get money, and, and first thing everybody wants to do is buy a car, buy jewelry, buy ice. But what are you going to do 20, 30, 40 years from now when you're trying to take care of your family, provide for your family? I mean, I, I like nice things, but, you know, it's, you have to get them in increments. I mean, believe it or not, I didn't buy my first car. I'm a professional football player. I didn't buy my first car to my eighth year in the league. So, like, how do you do it, right? I mean, my mom passed away. I had a 1993 Mitsubishi Galant. And I kid you not, I mean, I rushed for 210 yards one day, right? 210 yards. And I drove the Mitsubishi Galant to the stadium. And I, you know, I love Keyshawn Johnson. Keyshawn had the Phantom right here, <laughs> you know, the Mercedes. I mean, it was other cars, and it was my little blue Ford or Mitsubishi Galant right there. <laughs> and you know, and I didn't buy a new car until I went to Atlanta because, you know, guys on the team was like, it is time. Okay, you, you know, <laughs> it's time. I mean, I had over 100,000 miles on, and I was content with that. But I was like, the most important thing was first was building a foundation for my family and my future. Now, when I was able, when I felt like I was really able to afford it and reward myself, I went out and got something that I worked hard for. But I, I didn't do it because I saw the Joneses doing it. I did it because I want to do things different for, for my family and my future. And kids have to do that. I hope I answered that. I mean, that was a tough question. You're right. Warwick's got an early flight, so we need to probably go ahead and start signing books and buy his book over here. Well, uh, my man. You want to return for one more? I can talk. I mean, we'll make the flight. We'll make okay. the flight. All right. <laughs> He's the boss, so here, right here. My fellow Louisianian brother, by the way, of Alexandria. Okay, in the boot, the boot. We call Louisiana the boot. The boot, the, the boot. boot. Uh, contributing writer for Faith and Soul magazine in Lafayette, Louisiana. How important it is, uh, Warwick, for coaches as well as professionals to teach rookies and just high school and college players life skills because a lot of them come out and don't have, to have the life skills to survive. And you mentioned that, but I also wanted you to elaborate more on it. Well, I think life skills are important. Um, when I was a rookie, when I was a, when I, when I was a rookie in, I'm telling you my age, right, 1997, I was a rookie in the NFL. And we had to go to a record symposium. So the one thing, the one thing they stressed was, you know, a bunch of life skills. Just it's the little things that we, sometimes we take for granted. I mean, believe it or not, even after that life skills, the, that the symposium of life skills that we we took, I mean, my life still got turned off. I mean, I was still doing crazy things, and it it, it takes teaching them about credit. Um, you know, how to manage money, um, proper way to dress without having to overspend. I mean, if, uh, is that what you're talking about, life skills? Um, I mean, we've all experienced sometimes, you know, we have to bargain shop. It's, it's deals out there, right? It's, it's a bunch of deals. Definitely, this days of comedy, but you know, I did all of that stuff. I mean, I learned to balance my checkbook. I, I, I learned to uh, bargain shop. I mean, I, I shop at common places like everyone else, and you splurge every once in a while. But I started going to outlet malls when you had the opportunity to go to outlet malls because you feel like he's going to get a little bit cheaper, right? It may be a year old, but 
it's a little bit cheaper. But I had to uh, understand credit and, and eating the, the proper way. Like, I really don't eat fast food anymore. Like, I, I can't stand fast food. The smell of it makes me just throw up. But yeah, I started to do the little things that I needed to do to make sure that the way that I was living was efficient for me. And I think kids, and we all have to think about the ways of how we can save a penny. I mean, today is kind of, this, uh, this economy is kind of crazy, so we always have to figure out ways to budget and, and you know, save a few dollars and cents here and there. I don't know if that was life skills, but. All right, yeah, one more question back there. He's gonna make me run in a second. Yeah. Especially sad to leave, see you leave the second time from Tampa. Where are you going? Any Where am idea? I going? <laughs> well, I would tell you. <laughs> you know what? People have called, and I, I guess right now I'm 34 years old. I mean, I mean I'm young in life, but in football I'm like I'm old as dirt, right? So, <laughs> you know, I, I can still play the game, and, and I can I'll challenge high school kids. I would challenge anybody. But, you know, I know that my life is more than a game of football. And, and I've been blessed, like I said, man, to play as long as I have. I mean, how many, when I came out of school, like I said, I was 5'9", 175. Most people projected me to be around two or three years. And to have played 12 years and, you know, did all the things I've done, I, I've been blessed already. I've lived a great life. I've experienced a lot. I've had opportunity to change lives. and. and you know, make my corner of the world, the, the places that I've lived, better places, hopefully. So the future is bright. Let's just say that. <laughs> I, I look forward to uh, the next phase of my life. If, if I have opportunity uh, to play somewhere that I'm comfortable, then I'm going to do that. You got to think, I only need 40 yards for 11,000 yards, right? So that's kind of like a little driving force. And plus, who, who wants to win a Super Bowl? I do. You know, I want to have opportunity uh, to play in that game. So I'll just look at the, big, the, the best situation and, and just make the best uh, decision possible for myself and my family and my future. But if it's not football, believe me, you're, I'll still be around. I'll still be around. But I, really, I just want to, since she's about to run, run me off the stage, like, <laughs> like a lot of people don't know this, but when my mom was shot and killed, um, the city of Baton Rouge started a trust fund. I mean, they, they started a trust fund for us, and that's how we were able to make it. So really, my passion for life, my passion for giving back, my passion for helping people really started there. Sometimes, you know, things happen in your life, and you're not to the point to you can recognize that. And looking back on my life, when Coach Dungey challenged me, I mean, to me, that was really, they set the blueprint for my life, really. And they started a trust fund and it just really got us going. I mean, they, they made sure that we were able to pay bills and, and just stay together as a family. And, and the city of Baton Rouge really stepped up and, and kept us together. And they, and they taught me to not just care about yourself, but you care about your community, you care about your neighbors, and you, you care about your friends. So it's like I've lived my life that way a little bit of, of wherever I go, wherever I live, I want to be able to help people around me live better, give them opportunity to be better people, to give them the opportunity to have hope, stability, to change their generation, to change their futures, and hopefully make their futures brighter. And, and Baton Rouge did that for me, so that's why Baton Rouge is always going to be dear to my heart. But if I can encourage anybody, old, young, middle class, married, single, whatever, that it just, it just takes one thing. And you don't have to have a lot. I always, when I give talks sometimes, I keynote speak, I always say you, can, you don't have to give money. You can give your time, but your heart. You can give everything that you have, you know, just to change one person. And the, that old movie, Pass It On, the next person is going to remember that and pass it on to someone else because people have done it in my life. And I just want to encourage everyone, man, just you have an opportunity to help someone else better their life in, in areas that, that can improve for them, that can improve their lives to have a stability and, and, and a promising future, I encourage you to do that. I mean, we, 
we've all we've all been blessed to have great jobs and to to have great knowledge in creating wealth. I mean, we can help each other who are, who are less fortunate than we are. So, I appreciate you guys having me. I mean, it's, it's, Arkansas is kind of cool. It's, uh,